Welcome back, folks. It is now 1955, and we will start with a quick review of the programs. Early rocket development has two years remaining before the deadline, but the blocker right now is the first scientific satellite contract. Until that is completed, we cannot accept any new orbital programs, so we'll just hang on to this one for a while longer. When we do complete that contract, the plan will be to accept early lunar probes on breakneck. On the 1st of February is an R2 launch for a 320 kilometer downrange contract. Weighing in at just under 20 tons, this is fully fueled for 79 seconds of burn time and does not include a film camera. The RD-101 completes a full burn and transmits mass spec science from flying high and low orbit. This one has too much speed for a safe return, so we will just watch this burn up on re-entry. Even though we have the R7 launch complex underway, we will go for first orbit using a smaller launch vehicle. The orbital R3 is a Soviet analog to the Juno 1 rocket. This is an incremented upgrade using the 5000 km downrange rocket as the base. All tanks are changed to the lighter aluminum stringer, the 50 units of sounding payload is removed, and the RD-101 is changed to the RD-102. Other weight saving changes are also incorporated to get the Delta V over 9000, such as removing the upper stage fins and making the avionics the nose cone instead of having a separate structural part. A minor LC modification is required for the increased tonnage and height, but it only takes a week and it will cost a fraction of an R7 to launch. More engineers are hired to hit the 109 limit, then it gets built. May of 1955, we aim to place our first artificial satellite into orbit. The reward for first orbit is 50 applicants, which is a nice bump to staffing LCs or researchers. This is one of the many reasons I went this route instead of waiting for the R7. Another reason is this R3 rolled out for launch in just three months, costing only 11,000 funds. The R7, on the other hand, would need almost a year to build due to partial staffing and lower LC efficiency, and would cost 70,000 funds. Doing it this way will also give some breathing room if one or two R7 launches were to have failures. Back to this launch, the flight path is a stop at 60 degrees and reach an altitude around 160 kilometers. After first stage burnout, the upper stage decouples and immediately applies RCS to maintain ullage. It is pitched down to zero degrees and begins spinning up. Once we are at 65 seconds from Apogee, the next stage ignites, leaving behind the avionics. With this four-engine cluster, it can accommodate the loss of two engines and still reach orbit. But the last stages must fire successfully and burn fully for the mission to succeed. The final stage ignites, sending the craft to speeds never reached before. and then the spin of the camera, indicating that we have made orbit. With burn completion, the final orbital parameters are 159 by 943 kilometers, a success. We have achieved the first satellite in orbit and beat the historical date of Sputnik 1 by two years and five months. Two and a half months later, we have a follow-up R3 launch to gather some science. It's not feasible to gather mass spec science from suborbital flights due to the two-hour collection period. So this experiment is launched on the R3. This will be the final launch of the R3 rocket family. The objectives of the heavy satellite program requires 400 kilograms and 1,000 kilogram payloads. So we will be completing those using the R7.
With no more use for the R3, LC2 is downgraded for farming signs with more early film launches. The limit is reduced to 15 tons and will continue launching R1s going forward. Hopping into R&D, we set ourselves up for the early lunar program by spending the new science points on lunar range comms. October, we return to the R1 for more downrange contracts. This time around, we are going for the difficult contract of 410 kilometers, and will be heading southwest to reach some more biomes near the Aral Sea. But at 45 seconds into the flight, we experience an engine failure. With only reaching 25 kilometers altitude, there won't even be any science gathered with a film camera. So this launch was a total failure. We try again two months later. Thankfully this time, no engine issues. The biomes reachable from this heading are the desert, shores, and waters. This is only 186 kilometers from Baikonur, so for anyone planning to do a Soviet run themselves, give this heading a shot. And now we finally reach the completion of the R7 launch complex five days later. A few extra hours for the research of 56 to 57 orbital rocketry to complete and into the VAB. For this R7, it will be designed for the first scientific satellite contract. Satellite aeroscience science is still being researched, but we can begin integration. 56 to 57 rocketry does not have the engine configs to build the R7 like Sputnik 3, so the probe will include a U-2000 stage to give it the extra push and hit the orbital parameters needed for the contract. I've been building up a small surplus of funds to jumpstart the staffing for the R7, but even with 213,000 unlock credit, the unlock cost dipped into the budget, leaving only 5,800 funds once the rocket was added to the build queue. I also forgot about the unlocked leader from first orbit. So in admin, I settled for Arthur Valentine Cleaver to improve integration speeds. We assign the remaining free applicants from the First Orbit Award and move over some engineers from the RC-1LC. Then hire as many as we can afford with current funds to get to 112. Auto hire is set to 500 engineers and all that is left is warping until the end of the year. See you on the next episode when we will launch the massive R7.